Greetings, I'm chemist John Pendleton, and these are part of a series of conferences about creation, evolution, dinosaurs, the Bible, UFOs, ancient man, Big Bang, ape men. In our fifth conference, the last one, we saw about a number of clocks indicate a young earth, much similar to what the Bible measures out of about 6,000 years ago was the creation of everything. Today we're going to take a look at the famous ape men. Now, in Mexico, we had a program a number of years ago that uh, recently that I think would go good with this first transparency. Nothing personal. If you see anybody here that uh, you might know, it's just a pure coincidence. And actually we could ask the question like this fellow is asking, are there ape men in your ancestors? your ancestry. Some of you might say, well, there's some that sure act like it. Well, that's one thing, but more seriously about, you know, these ape-like creatures. Now, one of, the, I, one of the principles we're working on, there has two parts, that evolutionists are good at two thing, things, making up fascinating stories and drawing excellent pictures of things that don't exist. Here's another example of that. We have this skull, which has been found and pieced together. It's real science. It's real piece of evidence. We could go weigh it and measure it, ask who found it, where they found it, uh, how many pieces were there, how they glued it together, and all things like that. That's science. Who it belongs belong to, we don't know. What isn't science are the three pictures above. One looks kind of like a man, one looks kind of like an ape, and one looks like an ape man. All according to what the draw the artist wanted to depict. And now, with the many computer programs that we have, we have creatures like this guy. How about that? Let me tell you something. Just somebody really good with a uh, computer program of uh, Corel Draw or whatever could pick from here with the mouse, pick from here, stretch this, change the color, move this around, do that. And we have this guy. Guess what? He doesn't exist. Fine work of art, but it's not science. He's not one of your nor my ancestors. Where I live in Mexico, I found this page from a publication used by the Department of Education in Mexico. And what I've done is highlighted here on both sides of the page some of their key phrases. Let me read some to you. Appears to be, perhaps, reconstruction, reconstruction. Uh, it is thought, reconstruct, it's supposed, the other side says, approximately, approximately, reconstruction. We do not have very precise dates. We think, we calculate. Now, let me ask you, does that sound like science? Nothing of the sort. And also, I want you to look at these three fellows that are here. Now, I don't have any prejudices. I've already told you I believe that every person is made in the image and likeness of God. Every one of us, our descendants, we're part of a big family that comes from Adam and Eve. We're all related. Doesn't matter what our skin color is, or our height, or our width, we're all part of God's creation. We're all part of one human race, one human family. But as I look at all three of these pictures here, I'm almost sure that I've seen these guys walking on the streets of Mexico. Now, is that true? Well, of course not. But the way the artist drew them, it almost makes it look like people I've already seen. That's not science. Now, my youngest son, when he was in the sixth grade of primary school, had this text made by the Department of Education in Mexico. It could be a text from any place in the world because everybody copies everybody else, basically when it comes to evolutionary thought. And we have here the Homo habilis, Homo erectus, uh, Peking man, Java man, Neanderthal man, and Cro-Magnon man. Now, the Homo habilis, that was just a astralopithecine that they found some tools close by. In the beginning, the person that found the astralopithecine was ready to just own oh, another one of these. But then they found some tools nearby, put the two together, and said, well, this was man being able to do something. But we want to look more in detail at the uh, Homo erectus, Peking man, Java man, Neanderthal man. Now, Cro-Magnon man, he is so much like modern man that if we would just give him a good bath 
shave him, put him in a suit and tie, give him a, a briefcase, put him in any uh, business center, nobody would know the difference. He looks that much like modern man. Well, first let's take a look at Peking Man. This is the cave near Peking or Beijing, China, where in the 1920s they found burnt wood, stone tools, and cracked, smashed monkey skulls. Well, they put that all together and made not only Homo erectus, they also made Peking Man. Now, the use of fire and the use of tools is definitely a mark of man. We're the only ones that use fire. We're the only ones that make and use our own tools. Now, these cracked uh, monkey skulls is only what was left over from supper. Uh, this might sound strange to you, but where I live in Mexico, we have these delicious brain tacos that they put. You put some hot sauce on there, a little bit of shredded cabbage and... and, and uh, and cream, and they have a Coke, and well, um, anyway, they're really good. There are a lot of people that eat brains today. There's people in other parts of the world when they capture a monkey, they know that the flesh of the body is too tough, but they'll just cut off the head, take it home, put it on the coals, and when it's well enough cooked, they'll just split the skull open and eat the brains out. Now, it might not appeal to you, but it's a real delicacy for these people. And it was a real delicacy, apparently, for these people in this cave by Peking. But Apart from being just bad science and analysis of this, the worst part is that after World War II, all of the evidence for Peking Man was lost. We don't have any burnt wood, any wood, st uh, stone tools, we don't have any cracked monkey skulls, nothing. And yet after over 50 years, this is still in the textbooks. That is bad science. Then we have the Neanderthal Man. The Neanderthals are very famous, and we have lots of uh, skeletal remains of them. One skeletal remain that was found <clears throat> before the turn of the uh, 1900s, as I remember, was almost a complete skeleton. And when they put it together, it looked something like this. Kind of, you know, like it was a, they said, well, that looks like a, a monkey is going to stand upright like a human being. Yeah, that's it, that's it. And for decades, decades, that was the prevailing thought that, that the Neanderthals were monkeys coming up into an upright walking position like humans. Now with the science that really is science, the electron microscope was made. And so they analyzed these remains of Neanderthal man and found that he was lacking three things. He was lacking calcium, lacking vitamin D, and that he had arthritis. He wasn't a monkey on his way coming up, he was an old man on his way going down. Also, with science that is real science, they've done studies and found that the human skull continues to grow even in adults. Here in this top picture, we have the skull of a woman from ages 38 to 83. And you can see the lines of growth of her skull size at 34 and then her skull size at 83. In the lower picture, we have uh, three readings of a male from age 45 to 77. The human skull keeps growing. Now, again from our authority, we have evidence that after the flood that people still lived as much as two, three, four hundred years. Now, if the human skull keeps growing even in adults and we extrapolate the medical information that's been found, we would have skulls the size of Neanderthals. And so the Bible coincides. That's why the Neanderthals, so to speak, went extinct. Actually, they didn't go extinct. They were humans just like us, but they lived longer, and so they, their skulls especially and their bodies got certain uh, forms from their advanced age and growth. But they weren't in a transition to man. They actually were men themselves. Another famous uh, ape man is Java Man. In 1891, the an explorer by the name of uh, Dubois, uh, a Hollander, went to an island of the Pacific called Java. In that island he was digging and he found a skull cap definitely from some kind of an ape-like creature. At a distance of about 50 feet he found also a human leg bone, actually the femur that connects to the hip bone. And he put those two together, the head bone and the leg bone, and he made Java Man. 
He traveled the world for 28 years giving talks on this conference, as conferences on what he had found. Two years before he died, he admitted where he found the human leg bone, he also found two human skulls. But it was far more convenient, human leg bone, ape-like skull, Java man. And it's still in the books today. Now, that's not only bad science, it almost borders on basically being a fraud. But it's in the books. Next, maybe you haven't heard about Nebraska man. In 1922, in the state of Nebraska, the United States, they were digging and they found a tooth. Now, when they looked at that tooth, they said, well, that looks like it's from an ape. Turn that tooth. <sighs> looks like it's from a man. Ape, man, ape, man. We found the ape man. And with this abundance amount of information, one tooth, Nebraska man was created. This information went out over the whole earth, and in a matter of only 10 months, in a London illustrated newspaper, on the very front page appeared this exact drawing. Here we have Nebraska man, Nebraska woman, what she was making for breakfast, what kind of tools they had, their, who their neighbors were, everything, all from one tooth. Isn't evolutionary science amazing how much information you get out of just such little evidence? Well, somebody didn't buy into that idea and went over to Nebraska to find more of this Nebraska man. Digging in the exact same area, he found a jawbone, but it was missing a tooth. Where's that tooth? Brought the tooth, fit in perfectly. Who did the jawbone belong to? An ape? No. A man? Neither. It belonged to an extinct pig. And you know, that's the first time in history that a pig has made a monkey out of an evolutionist. Well, again, with science that is real science, in 1976 in Paraguay, South America, they found that this pig, the Picari, is still alive. He has not become extinct. Now, not to lay aside lightly the female sector, we have the beautiful Lucy. Lucy was found in 1973 in Africa. They found, they say, 40% of her skeletal structure. Uh, she was very short. She was only about uh, three feet high. But in order for her to walk uprightly, they had to go about another two miles further in that direction, 200 feet deeper into the, the soil to find a kneecap so that she could write, walk uprightly like a human. And obviously it was from the same skeletal structure. It's things like this that show you over and over how bankrupt human evolution is. Also, in Indonesia, in the part near in Sumatra by Kerinci, there are reports from the natives that they have actually seen ape-like creatures about three feet tall that walk uprightly like humans. Maybe these are the last living astralopithecines, of which we have many fossils, but they're a species in themselves. No way in transition to becoming humans. One of the most painful things for human evolution has been Piltdown Man. In 1912, in a rock quarry next to Piltdown, England, Dr. Charles Watson found the skull cap of a human. Nearby was a jawbone from an ape-like creature, but it had teeth formed like human beings. What did they say? It's obvious human evolution. In a period of over 40 years, almost 500 theses were written on this abundance of information for human evolution. Again, with science that is science, the electron microscope was invented. They analyzed these remains. They found three things. One, that they had been painted or treated with some chemical substances to give the indication of very old age. Secondly, is that they weren't as old as they thought. The pieces were about 100 to 400 years old. And thirdly, that the teeth had been filed 
to give the formation and appearance of human teeth. Well, they say at first, it's obvious human evolution. Well, they say now, it's obvious it was a fraud. Now, that's not the end of the story. The most difficult question still remains. Of the many doctoral diplomas and certificates that were given out, a thesis based on a fraud, how many of those were returned back in? How many of those were recollected? Not a one. Not a single one. And in that, those that believe in human evolution show that what their belief is is nothing but a religious belief. It is not science. For years, the belief has been that man has evolved and that his brain capacity got bigger and bigger. But in Leotoli, Africa, they found these side-by-side -side footprints of apparently an adult, probably a mother, with a young child. But the volcanic ash there tests out at 3.7 millions of years old. So now they change their story and they make drawings where you have these human-like feet and above is an ape-like creature. So we don't know which way we really evolved. Again, they're trying to make up a story, but really we are part of God's creation. Now whenever you see an article in a magazine, or in a newspaper especially, that has something to talk about the evolution from apes, prepare yourself for some very interesting reading and even some good laughs. I bought this magazine just a couple years ago. It says, How Apes Became Human. Now, I'm also an auto mechanic, an automotive technician, and when I buy a manual that says how alternators work, how carburetors work, how brakes work, and things of this nature, how a starter is repaired, I expect it to tell me in detail how these things work, how to repair them, how to make them function correctly. And so when I get a magazine from Time, which is backed up by millions of dollars, hundreds if not thousands of people of expertise in so many areas of, of knowledge, and they say that in the title of this magazine, How Apes Became Human, I want them to tell me how it happened. The inside cover, since this is its main feature story, talks about the dawn of man, the discovery of a handful of bones, did you get that? A handful of bones in Ethiopia brings scientists tantalizing close to the time six million years ago when our most ancient ancestors took their first upright steps. Wow, isn't that fantastic? A handful of bones. Now as I read through this article, and as you read through your article, you'll find things like this. Uh, we're not sure how. There are different opinions. It's not entirely clear. We believe, perhaps, uh, it is it is uh, generally believed, things of this nature, that, that's not science. They're guessing, they're feeling around. Now, the real key to this whole thing was this also, this one toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. One bone. Now, if you pay attention to these articles, as I say it, they always shoot themselves in the foot. They always give it away that they really don't know what they're talking about. Because as the article went on, they said that this one toe bone was found 10 miles away from the handful of bones that proved that the creature was. But obviously it was from the same creature. I mean, can anything be more ridiculous? Those are the things that pass for human evolution. Now, this diagram, as you can see, is with the intent of showing us the evolution of the different species. These are all drawings, but this has an effect upon, I believe, all of us. Some of us more, some of us less. But we have this idea because of skin color, of uh, slanted eyes that the Orientals have. Actually, they have more, a little more fat up here in their eyebrow that makes their eye look a little more squinted. Uh, different kinds of hair, different bone structure, different facial features. That we have this idea that there's different races. Nothing of the sort. It's just all part of the one species, the one race, the human race. Now, 
this picture on the right is of two Australian citizens. The white man is obviously from British descent, as the British coloners colonized Australia. The black man is obviously from Aboriginal descent. And the two of them were very good buddies during World War II. They were in the Australian Army during the Second World War. Well, if you make a little calculation, obviously with the passing of time, they're both going to get older. And as it happened that the black man's kidneys began to fail. He needed a kidney donation. Now, you don't have to be a scientist to realize that to receive an organ donation cannot be from just anybody. There's a number of requirements that have to be met so that the donation of the organ will be accepted by the body of the recipient. Well, as amazing as it is, and as I said, we're all of the same race, the white man donated one of his kidneys to the black man. And as we have the saying, it fit like a glove. It was a perfect match. And so now the white man's kidney is in the black man's body and he's functioning perfectly well. And that's a real blow to this racism idea. <clears throat> of the many quotes that we could give in closing, I like this one from Dr. Lyle Watson. He says, the fossils that decorate our family tree are so scarce that there are still more scientists than specimens. The remarkable fact is that all the physical evidence that we have for human evolution can still be placed with room to spare inside a single coffin. Actually, the evidence we have for human evolution proves nothing. And actually, the real evidence is enough to only go inside of one coffin. No evidence whatsoever. Now, I'd like to kind of finish this section out with an application. Uh, we haven't had much chance for that in these other conferences, but I think this is a real key time because there's four questions in life everyone needs to answer. Answer as soon as possible. Answer correctly because it will give an entire direction to your life. And that is, who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where will I go after I die? Let's take the two belief systems. Let's take evolution and creation. According to evolution, who am I? I am about 210 pounds of water and chemical substances. Where did I come from? I came from an explosion that happened about 20 billion years ago. Why am I here? I don't have the faintest idea. Where will I go after I die? To become part of the other water and chemicals that make up this earth. What lousy answers. What lousy motivation to even exist, to keep on living, to keep on trying to get better. Let's go to the side of creation. According to creation, who am I? I'm an important person made in the image and likeness of my creator. Where did I come from? I came from a loving, intelligent creation. Why am I here? To know, love, serve, and obey, trust my creator and savior, Jesus Christ. Where will I go after I die? Because Jesus Christ lives in my life. I'm going to be with him forever. Wow, what a big difference your origin makes from just a big explosion, no real purpose to life, or from an intelligent creation, from an intelligent, loving creator that can be known and have fellowship with and relationship with. You know, when I was studying at the university, my major was chemistry. I had a scholarship for four years at the university. And my whole goal was to get a degree in chemistry. I just loved the sciences, loved learning about these things. And yet I have to admit too that I got involved in drinking, theft, foul language, wrong use of sex, and just plain selfish, proud person. Now every Sunday I would go to church. I would never miss a Sunday for church. I always believed in the religious belief that I was brought up with, but still I had all these sins that were plaguing my life. My sophomore year, life continued as I already mentioned, but something happened on a special uh, Monday, and then we had some religious speakers come into my fraternity. Now when I heard that, I said to myself, I'm not going to that. The president of our house said, if anybody doesn't go to this meeting, you'll have a house fine. I said, okay, I'll go to that meeting. 
But I very much believed in my religion, even though my religion could not change me. But these fellows about my age, I was 19 years old, told about how their lives used to be, how they came to know Jesus Christ, and how Jesus Christ had changed their lives. Well, this was really unusual to me because I believed in God, I believed in Jesus Christ, but my life was going from bad to worse. The last man gave a talk from the Bible, and I didn't really follow anything that he said until the end when he quoted this verse from John 1.12 that says, But to as many receive him, Jesus Christ, to them he gives the power to become the children of God, even to those that believe on his name. Well, I reasoned this way. You'll have to forgive me if this sounds bad, but I thought I'm going to do an experiment with Jesus Christ. I'm going to see if he can change my life because I cannot change it. And so I prayed a prayer something like this. I said, God, I have sinned against you. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Take control of my life. Make me be the person that you want me to be. Help me to know you and to live with your power. Amen. And I began to trust that what Jesus said was true, that he now lived with inside me. From that day forward, I never got drunk once again. In two weeks, he changed my vocabulary drastically for the better. And after four weeks, he freed me of four years of the wrong use of sex. Not only to take away the evil out of my life, the wrong, he gave me of his riches, a joy that's from the inside, not based on my circumstances. The certainty that when I die, I'm gonna be with him in heaven and also to help others like you that are watching here to have greater faith in Him. And if you've never asked Christ into your life, you can do it right now, just as I did. Ask Him into your life to forgive your sins, to control your life. Our next conference is going to be about fossils. There's millions and millions of them out there. What do they teach us? See you soon. God bless you.